Hello, and welcome to this CLE presentation on the Telemachian Law of Practice. My name is Ilan Weinreb, and I am the managing member of the Weinreb Law Firm, PLLC, a civil litigation firm located out of Garden City, New York, that focuses on individual and small business commercial litigation. After working for a number of years at both large and small law firms, I started my own practice in January of 2014. I have considerable experience in the use of technology in the practice of law and have authored articles on the topic, some of which will be referenced in this presentation. Over approximately the next hour, I will be discussing a number of practice suggestions that I have found to be not only useful, but essential in running my practice. Many of these practice suggestions in and of themselves are not original. Rather, it is their combined use, their integration, that I consider to be original. As a preliminary matter, I make this disclaimer. Not everything that you are about to see or hear in this presentation may ultimately work for you or your practice. Depending upon what type of law you practice, certain practice suggestions may not be practical, cost-effective, or sufficient. For example, if you are a litigator who encounters HIPAA or similar regulatory schemes that require enhanced protection of confidential information, simple do-it-yourself encryption of files, a topic which we will discuss later on, may not be legally acceptable action. Likewise, if you want to run a paperless office, another topic which we will discuss later on, but other people in your office are not so keen on the idea, it will be difficult, if not impossible, to accomplish this endeavor. Fortunately, running a Telemachian law practice is not an all-or-nothing proposition. You can easily pick and choose one, two, or more of the suggestions presented here and still realize improvements, gains, and benefits. The phrase Telemachian law practice is derived from the name Telemachus, a major character from Homer's Odyssey. His name in Greek means one who strikes from afar. As a side point, it can also mean far from battle, and this is supported by the fact that Telemachus never fought in the Trojan War, but as we'll soon find out, he had anything but a conflict-free life. As such, I prefer the first meaning of his name, one who strikes from afar. That concept has applied to the legal world. The idea of being able to practice law from afar, or near for that matter, appealed to me when I first started practicing law over 12 years ago. It still appeals to me today as a litigator who has had occasion to travel and litigate cases in various locations. I thus decided to write an article inspired by Telemachus's name that was published in the September 2014 edition of the New York County Lawyers Association's monthly periodical, New York County Lawyer. This presentation is essentially an expansion upon that article, which identified powerful and cost-effective technology as being the means for one to achieve the flexibility, mobility, and versatility that I consider to be the essential features, the sine qua non, of a Telemachian law practice. Thus, while I will be discussing a variety of techniques and technologies here, and as we'll see later, 12 separate steps to achieving a Telemachian law practice, there is a common unifying focus to all of the detail. That is the Telemachus principle. Flexibility, mobility, and versatility achieved through powerful and cost-effective technology. Telemachus as a character in the Odyssey epitomizes these virtues of flexibility, mobility, and versatility. As we see from the slide here, Telemachus was the son of Odysseus, one of the heroes of the Trojan War, and Penelope, 
Odysseus' wife. As a young man, Telemachus was much favored by Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom. When Odysseus had been absent for twenty years, having originally left his home kingdom of Ithaca to fight with other kings of Greece in the Trojan War, and Penelope was being urged to marry one of the insolent and unruly suitors who infested their home, Athena prompted the hesitant and diffident Telemachus to stand up to the suitors and order them to leave. His order did little good, but with Athena's help, he sailed to inquire after his father's fate. By the time Telemachus got back to Ithaca, after many travels and after finding his father, he was a much more self-confident and assertive young man. He got to prove his newly acquired maturity when he joined Odysseus in slaughtering the suitors and then standing up to their outraged relatives in the final bloody scene of the Odyssey. And so we see Telemachus, one of the original literary road warriors, as a character who did have to travel, but who developed and persevered throughout his travels. He survives by invoking wisdom, represented by Athena. And, as anyone who has traveled at length knows, he certainly needed a great measure of flexibility, the adaptation to changing circumstances, mobility, productive movement, and versatility, resourcefulness, to successfully complete his mission. So, how does one take the spirit of Telemachus, flexibility, mobility, and versatility, and apply it to the practice of law? If we pose this question to Telemachus, given his experience, he'd probably tell us to ask Athena, meaning wisdom, for help. Fortunately, wisdom abounds in the field of law and technology, and so much so that one can easily drown in it. But in an attempt to limit all of this material for purposes of this presentation, I gave you three resources that have assisted me in setting up my practice as a Telemachian one. The first is Attorney Benjamin Yale's wonderful book, The Paperless Law Office, in which Mr. Yale instructs attorneys on the advantages and disadvantages of going paperless, and perhaps more importantly, provides practical advice on going paperless, or really, as he explains, making one's practice as paperless as possible. While fascinating, Mr. Yale's 253-page book is somewhat of a read, and until you actually apply some of the concepts he speaks of, such as central root storage, the book can at some times be abstract and esoteric. Thus, if you're either short on time or completely new to using technology as part of your practice, you can get the vast majority of the practical tips found in Mr. Yale's book, as well as some of the theory on paperless practice, from Ernie the Attorney Svensson a commercial litigator who is located in New Orleans. Mr. Svensson, as well as some other attorneys who work along with him, maintain a website known as paperlesschase.com, which, as the name implies, discusses paperless law practice. Mr. Svensson has a number of guides on paperless practice, one of which he authored for a Clio webinar entitled Do Not Print a Lawyer's Guide to Going Paperless. Finally, there is a wonderful opinion by the Association of the Bar of the City of New York that came out last year, which discusses ethical issues in the use of a virtual law office by New York attorneys. Now, one does not need to have a virtual law office set up when he or she decides to have a Telemachian law practice. However, the general concept of the virtual office, a physical office that one uses on demand for only the time that such an office is needed, certainly comports with the Telemachian ideal of flexibility, mobility, and versatility. This can be easily observed from a review of the digest portion of the opinion, where it was stated, quote, A New York lawyer may use the street address of a virtual law office located in New York State as the principal law office address for the purposes of Rule 7.1H of the New York Rules of Professional Conduct, even if most of the lawyer's work is done at another location. In addition, a New York lawyer may use the address of a virtual law office as the office address on business cards, letterhead, and law firm website. Given the lower overhead, improved encryption systems, expansion of mobile communication options, availability of electronic research, and the ease of storing and transmitting digital documents and information, 
virtual law offices are becoming an increasingly attractive option for attorneys throughout the country. End quote. The benefits and features of virtual law office practice that I just quoted from the Association of the Bar of the City of New York's opinion, the attorney's performance of work at any location, decreased overhead, use of encryption and mobile communication systems, and digital storage and transmission of information are exactly the same as those involved in establishing a Telemachian law practice. As such, guidance and insight on establishing such a practice can often be gleaned from materials like the Association of the Bar of the City of New York's opinion discussing virtual law office practice. So, you may ask yourself, where and how do I start making the jump to Telemachian practice? The answer to this question can be found simply by looking around you, that is, in your current law office, and by evaluating your current level of flexibility, mobility, and versatility, what I'll sometimes refer to as FMV from here on in, and then determining how to use technology to enhance it. Part of this analysis is to recognize that time and space are both constraints on your FMV level. If one schedule is jam-packed, even with productive or otherwise worthwhile activities, he or she is not going to have as much FMV as someone without such a busy schedule. Similarly, if an attorney has a lack of available storage space in his or her office due to thousands of pages of paper near the front door of that office, he or she is not going to have as much FMV as someone running a paperless practice. And it's not only important to realize that time and space are constraints on FMV, the two are often linked together themselves. Take the last example that I just gave of the attorney drowning in thousands of pages of paper near the front of his or her office. Assume that he or she has a court appearance requiring the physical filing and service of motion papers in advance, as opposed to the electronic filing and service of those papers. Let's further assume that the exhibits required as part of that filing are all scattered throughout the thousands of pages of paper near the front door of the office. To prepare the physical motion papers, the exhibits will have to be located, which requires an expenditure of time. The assembly and ordering of such papers, which take up physical space, will require another expenditure of time. Once the motion papers are prepared, they must usually be copied for opposing counsel, clients, or the court. That involves further expenditure of time and the occupancy of additional space. The papers then have to be physically filed and served, which again requires an expenditure of time because someone has to leave the space of the office in order to accomplish this task. Finally, after the motion is argued, any additional copies of the papers must be maintained in the office or sent to storage, either of which eats up space, and there is, of course, an expenditure of time in transferring the papers to either location. And even if the papers are ultimately shredded by a third party, it still takes time to transfer the papers to that third party. Now, let's consider the opposite situation. That instead of the physical filing and service of the motion papers, all that was required was their electronic filing and service. The exhibits still have to be called together from the stacks of paper near the front office door. But at the same time, once the motion papers are finally assembled into one set and fed through a scanner, Nobody needs to have multiple copies made. Nobody needs to leave the office to have the papers successfully filed and served. And nobody needs to have multiple copies of the papers sent to storage or shredded. In short, here, electronic filing and service saves considerable time and space simultaneously in many aspects. And those savings translate into increased FMV for the attorney preparing the motion. Technology is thus key to increasing FMV, and it does this by relaxing FMV's two major constraints, space and time. With respect to space, technology can give a practitioner more of it via the consolidation of all relevant practice information in one centralized environment. That centralized environment is what attorney Benjamin Yale, the author of the Paperless Law Office, terms root storage in Chapter 10 of his book, on page 126. In his words, quote, 
One rule in storing data is there must be one root storage. Root storage is storage that holds the best, most recent, and most accurate copies of documents. This is not theoretical, but the lawyer must treat it as so. It, and here Mr. Yale refers to root storage, is the one storage location that interacts with the user and the one storage location that the user instinctively and routinely turns to for needed documents. Once it is established, this is the default location for storing documents and retrieving them. End quote. It follows that the practitioner who invokes technology to maintain root storage should not have multiple paper copies of documents floating about, which translates to savings in space, which translates, in turn, to greater FMV. Similarly, with respect to time, when effective technology is employed, relevant practice information can be accessed, manipulated, or otherwise utilized much more quickly than in the absence of such technology. We see this from the following practical examples. If we compare the search or find function in word processors against simple human eyeball searches of various documents, the clear winner is going to be the computer. A human being simply cannot identify and categorize, as many modern word processors do, various terms in one environment as well as a computer. The same applies to blacklining of drafts in most cases. A computer is going to be able to perform this task much more quickly than an entire team of attorneys. The time-saving advantages of technology are also apparent in the area of motion, preparation, and assembly. This was alluded to in the last slide, where we discussed how, by feeding paper documents into a scanner and then electronically filing them, one can realize significant time savings, as well as space savings. If you're interested in this topic, I suggest that you check out my article, The Powerful PDF, which was published in the December 2014 edition of New York County Lawyer. And finally, automation of drafting and other tasks can save attorneys what is sometimes an incredible amount of time than if such tasks are performed in piecemeal fashion by human beings. In the last slide, I explained that effective technology is a means for controlling time by increasing FMV. In the world of telemachian practice, effective technology is personally useful technology. Thus, before transforming your practice into a telemachian one, it is a good idea to realistically gauge your abilities and your own practice needs prior to purchasing or otherwise acquiring technology that can affect the transformation. There is no magic bullet or magic guide to conducting this type of analysis. It's ultimately based upon the type of law that you've practiced and your experience. Notwithstanding this, there still is a concept of overkill in the Telemachian universe. One does not need to become a computer programmer or information systems expert in order to transform one's practice into a Telemachian one. Some practical advice that I've found to be useful in the past is to look before you leap, before buying any new technology. You can do this by downloading trial versions of various software or alternatively going to a friend and asking him or her what his or her experience has been with software, perhaps even having him or her demonstrate such software in front of you. As part of looking before you leap, I also recommend that in assessing the utility of any potential new technology, you practice using it in a jargon-free environment, meaning not a store or some other place of purchase, and using your own personal vernacular to describe and otherwise explore the usefulness of the technology. Don't use terms like integrations, platforms, and document populations if you're not familiar with them. And if you can't explain a technology without using these terms, it's probably not useful. 
Once you've identified, or at least given some thought to, the type of technology that is personally useful to you and your practice, the next step in transforming your practice into a Telemachian one is to use this technology to master space and time, the two constraints upon FMV. I've identified six steps that relate to the mastery of space and six steps that relate to the mastery of time. The first step in mastering space is to realize that cyberspace is all space and no space simultaneously. This is not an active use of technology, but a theoretical realization that will give you a new perspective on technology. For example, if one realizes that a modern day one terabyte hard drive can easily contain the data represented by documents stored in 10,000 filing cabinets, the acquisition of such a drive becomes a no brainer. Who wouldn't want to be the owner of 10,000 filing cabinets without having to dedicate physical space for such cabinets, and all for $80, the going price of a one terabyte drive? With this mindset in place, the next step in mastering space is to always have at least two means of access to the internet. The reality of modern legal practice in all fields is that internet access is a necessity, not only for accessing practice information, but for communicating with others as well. For the Telemachian practitioner who relies upon the internet to strike from afar, having constant access to the internet is an absolute necessity. A traditional internet service provider like Cablevision, Comcast, Verizon, or AT&T certainly fits the bill here. In addition to traditional ISPs, there are also mobile services, and chances are if you have a smartphone, you can access the internet using your particular device. The mobile nature of mobile internet service makes it an excellent choice for the Telemachian practitioner. Finally, there is Wi-Fi or wireless internet access, which can usually be found in courts, airports, hotels, and other public locations. By always having two of the three methods of access listed here available, the Telemachian practitioner is effectively always connected and most capable of striking from afar. Once your two means of access to the internet are firmly established, the next step in using technology to master space is to realize that a scanner is one of your best friends. Scanners, which are devices used for creating digital images of paper documents, have revolutionized the way that attorneys practice law. They are the basis for e-filing. They assist in the preparation of presentations such as this one. And as discussed earlier, they facilitate motion and other legal document preparation. More importantly, they allow attorneys to either recover or acquire physical space. Insofar as when most documents have been successfully scanned and saved, they can immediately be shredded. In short, less paper means more space, and the ability to unshackle oneself from space constraints in one's practice. In addition, should there ever be a need to reproduce a document that was scanned in paper form, thank God we have a wonderful invention called the printer, which allows one to do this very easily. In addition to taking up less space than paper documents, scanned documents are also unique in that they often can be converted via optical character recognition software to searchable documents like Microsoft Word or simple text documents. Saved OCR documents that were originally fed through a scanner can then be combined via programs such as Adobe Acrobat into portfolio files or combined files which then allow users to search for terms throughout the entire file in one shot. Scanners thus indirectly obviate the need for the creation of document indexes, which of course saves time as well as space.
There are certainly many more things that one can do with a scanner to increase one's FMV level from not only a space but a time perspective. But at the very least, if one ends up using a scanner to save documents in digital or electronic form, a technique represented by the scan and save phrase on the slide, and uses them only and solely for this purpose, there still will be a benefit to be gained. Beyond cutting down on paper by the use of scanners, you can also increase your mastery of space by using technology to save on typical office supply purchases. Let's take two favorites of the legal community, highlighters and whiteout, as examples. If one uses Microsoft Word or Adobe Acrobat to actually edit documents which have been saved, one does not need these supplies anymore. Both of these programs offer redaction and highlighting functions, which are perfect substitutes for physical highlighters and whiteout bottles. While it is true that not every item that is used in a legal office, such as binder clips, has a direct substitute in the digital world, it is also the case that such items, which are often very much connected to the use of paper and copies, do not have to be purchased in particularly large quantities, simply because there has been a general reduction in paper. It is certainly possible for an attorney who has reduced the use of paper in his or her practice to purchase just a single box of binder clips, say around 200, and not run out even after an entire year has passed. Such an attorney not only saves space by purchasing only one box of binder clips for an entire year, but also money when compared to his or her counterparts who are using much more paper as part of their practices. After you have reduced paper as much as possible in your practice, and then have proceeded to reduce the number of supplies that you've purchased, the next step in mastering space is to protect the digital space that you are planning to use or are currently using. This is accomplished through disk and file encryption, or more simply, putting virtual locks on data locations and data itself. By using encryption at either level, you do not only protect digital space that you may have acquired, but at the same time, you actually master the space of those who seek to do you, and by extension, your clients harm, namely hackers, or other unauthorized people. Let's assume that a hacker obtains an encrypted file and places it on his or her hard drive or a server that he or she controls. He or she then attempts to access this file, only to find out that it is indeed encrypted. If the encryption is powerful enough, the hacker will not be able to successfully gain access to the file, and then the file effectively becomes something kicking up wasted space on his or her drive. In such a case, the hacker will more likely than not discard the file. It thus is the case that, even though it was never your intention to do so, you have effectively controlled the hacker's cyberspace for the time that the file resided there. While there are many different utilities for both disk and file encryption, I have found that a combination of the three utilities listed on this slide usually works well. Microsoft BitLocker is included as part of various versions of the Windows operating system. It's a very easy-to-use utility that can encrypt not only fixed drives that come along with most desktop systems, but also removable drives such as memory sticks or USB external hard drives. 7-Zip is a free utility that can be used to encrypt zip archives as well as other type of archives thus obviating the need for one to encrypt individual files themselves. However, if one wishes to encrypt such individual files, then 
One of the best ways of doing so is by transferring the file or converting it if it's not already in PDF format, that's Adobe's portable document format, and then using Adobe Acrobat's password security function to encrypt the individual file. Finally, the sixth and final step in using technology to master space is to further protect your digital space by setting up a backup routine. It's important in setting up any type of backup routine to utilize the concept of root storage that Mr. Yale discusses in his book and which I discussed previously. The root storage system allows for a centralized environment, essentially where all practice information is stored in one location, and then that particular location is backed up in multiple locations. So as to maximize FMV as far as telemachian practice is concerned, there should be two types of backup that are utilized. The first is to the internet, meaning cloud-based backup, through the use of providers like Carbonite or Mosey that allow for one to back up all files securely to secure servers located on the internet. Often, these backup services provide for access of data on tablets and smartphones, in addition to access via computer. In addition, one should also have a backup location of root storage that is independent of the internet in case, for whatever reason, the internet is not working for you on a given day. To set up this backup location, it's advisable to use replication software, and here I've given free file sync as an example, for direct physical backups of root storage to media that in itself is stored in at least two separate geographic areas. The advantage to such a system is that in the event of, God forbid, the damage or destruction of one particular location via malware such as CryptoLocker that encrypts all content on a given hard drive, the portable media and the separate geographic location can be used to restore you or really digitally resurrect you to the place that you were before being affected by the malware. A separate geographic area backup routine also offers partial natural disaster and unforeseeable event protection insofar as if one particular location is destroyed not by a digital threat such as malware but by a physical threat such as fire or flood then the media in the separate geographic area presumably is safe and can be used, again, to resurrect you digitally to where you were before the calamity occurred. Finally, local disk imaging technologies that serve to clone or resurrect entire hard drives, programs, and data, and not just data, such as a Cronus True Image, are certainly useful, but they are nowadays also icing on the cake and not particularly necessary on account of the rise of the software-as-a-service model. The software-as-a-service model allows one to download software from a particular website on demand as many times as he or she needs the download to be performed, such that the software does not reside so much on a person's personal driver device as on the Internet or in the cloud. Examples of software as a service include Microsoft Office 365, Adobe Acrobat DC, which stands for Document Cloud, that's the latest version of Adobe Acrobat, and WordRake, which is a program developed by attorney Gary Kinder that automates proofreading while one is drafting. Since all of these programs can be downloaded relatively easily and on multiple devices, including tablets and smartphones, it's much more important nowadays to back up practice data rather than individual practice programs. Nonetheless, for attorneys who wish to have the ultimate convenience in backup technology, disk imaging software is certainly useful and does have its place in telemarketing and law practice. Before moving into the next part of the presentation, 
on the use of technology to master time. I'd like to discuss one of the programs mentioned in the previous slide. That program is Free File Sync, a free replication, or what is also known as a synchronization program, that allows for the backup of a root storage location to multiple other locations. If we take a look at the screenshot, which I took from my computer on May 12, 2015, we see a centralized root location, here being the D colon TWLFPLLC main directory, to three separate media locations, here being a removable drive, that would be the H drive, a network drive, that would be the X drive, which in itself is backed up to the cloud, and to another laptop via a wireless internet connection, and that is the O drive. One uses free file sync by running a comparison of the root storage location against all of the locations where one would like to back up the root storage data, and then getting a report, which is what you see in front of you, as to the status of the anticipated backup or synchronization. Green arrows, like those in the center, represent the presence of new or newly modified files. If, however, there is information that was updated on the other side to go back into root storage, and often this happens when one uses a laptop outside of the office to update certain documents, then arrows going the other way from right to left will appear. After the comparison is finally run, the synchronized button in the right side of the screen is pressed, and Free File Sync proceeds to work its magic, syncing the root storage location with all other desired locations, including removable media. Just as there are six steps in using technology to master space, so too are there six steps in using technology to master time. The first of these steps is to realize that documents are the least common denominator of the legal world. Whether you are a litigator, transactional attorney, government attorney, or other type of attorney, no matter which jurisdiction or in which field you practice, there is no question that you will have to deal with the review, analysis, comparison, and drafting of documents. As such, any technology that allows you to prepare, present, and process documents is extremely valuable and will increase your FMV level and your ability to strike from afar. The next step in using technology to master time is to apply theory to practice by automating document drafting and preparation as much as possible. The term automation does not imply that documents write themselves, but rather that the tasks which are associated with document editing and preparation are performed by computers in a standardized formulaic fashion. Examples of some document automation products include the form tool, which allows one to insert certain fields and corresponding values in a table that is placed at the end of a document, and then having those fields as they appear in the document populated or filled in via an automated procedure that calls upon the values that have been previously stored in the field table. Hotdocs works in a similar fashion. WordRake is a little bit different insofar as it performs automated document editing as opposed to document generation, which is the focus of the form tool and hot docs. The program, which was the brainchild of attorney Gary Kinder, acts as a digital rake by comparing a given piece of writing against grammatical patterns associated with awkward or stilted writing. The program invokes Microsoft Word's Track Changes features to highlight suggested changes to the author, 
and then gives the author the option of accepting or rejecting those changes. If used in conjunction with other editing techniques, WordRake has the potential to save much time in editing and at the same time improve your writing. In addition to using specific document automation programs, one can also use onboard fields and cross-referencing in word processing software to save much time in drafting. Examples of field and cross-reference combinations abound, with one of my favorites being the combination of a sequence field in Microsoft Word with a caption cross-reference. This combination is a real time saver in that it allows you to specify exhibits dynamically, meaning that you can put down a letter or a number for a specific exhibit, then add additional exhibits to motion papers, and then after those exhibits have been added, simply with a couple of keystrokes, have every single exhibit designation in the document or documents in which the sequence fields and cross-references appear, automatically updated to account for the additional exhibits. The sequence field caption cross-reference combination also works well in a situation where exhibits are deleted and not just added. In addition to using fields and cross-referencing in word processing software, you can also use templates of commonly used documents to save significant time. But keep in mind when using templates that you cannot rely upon them blindly, especially when they've been obtained from a third-party website with which you've had no experience. Having a stock library of templates is also good for business development in two aspects. First, if a colleague needs help with a certain matter, and you have the template that he or she is looking for, then congratulations, you've just probably made yourself a new friend who may also give you referral leads in the future. Second, should you have a potential client who is somewhat hesitant about forming an attorney-client relationship because he or she is not familiar with that type of relationship, you can use a template that you have for an engagement letter to illustrate the rights and responsibilities of the attorney-client relationship for the potential client, which may result in that potential client becoming an active client. Finally, many practice management software packages, such as Clio, Rock and Matter, and Cosmolex, allow you to automatically generate invoices, statements of account, and other billing-related documents. In the next slide, I will discuss a sample invoice generated from Clio. So here we have a sample invoice generated from Clio that includes my firm graphic, name of my firm, relevant contact information, the name of the client this invoice is being sent to, the matter number associated with that client, the nature of the representation, and a detailed list of services and expenses for which the client has been billed. All of the individual line items that appear in the services and expenses sections are called from a database of time activities and expense activities that is maintained on Clio. Invoices in Clio are generated as PDF documents that are downloaded by Clio users, and if need be, these PDF invoices can be converted to RTF, rich text format, editable invoices. Clio's invoicing workflow also has another feature that saves its users time, and that is the ability to edit time or expense line items appearing on individual invoices and then having the original records associated with such line items in the time and expense activities database automatically updated.
Once you have automated document generation and drafting as much as possible, the next step in using technology to master time is to employ a document management system that will facilitate speedy and efficient access to needed documents. A good document management system will allow you to search for documents using various terms and then display the results of such a search in an easy to navigate list similar to the lists of cases that are displayed by legal research software products when one conducts a search in those environments. A good DMS will also provide for version control of documents, meaning that it will allow you to track revisions to a single document over time by designating each revised version of a document with a new document version designation. Many practice management software products such as Clio, Rocket Matter, and Cosmolex include an onboard DMS. One of the major advantages of the document management systems that are included in these practice management software products is secure portal access or the ability for clients to upload and view either their own documents or documents that you have worked on pertaining to their matters in a digitally secure environment protected by SSL encryption used by banks and government agencies for the protection of sensitive information. There is obviously a cost to using document management systems that are created via standalone commercial products or practice management software suites such as those mentioned in this slide. Solo and small firm practitioners can avoid these costs, at least in part, by using operating system-based file management such as Windows Explorer in conjunction with a program known as DocFetcher. DocFetcher is a free utility that allows one to search all of the files in his or her root storage. DocFetcher, however, does not allow for version control with respect to various documents, and so a practitioner who is using operating system-based file management must either save individual versions of files in separate folders or alternatively use programs like Microsoft Word that offer onboard version control. In addition to DocFetcher, Adobe Acrobat allows users to create portfolio files that work like zip or other archive-based storage files, essentially a file containing other files. As I mentioned previously, with the creation of a proper index, these files are completely searchable and can save you much time in situations where a specific exhibit tied to a specific matter needs to be located, such that a general search using DocFetcher would be too broad. Finally, Ernie Svensson, who appeared earlier in this presentation, has a wonderful tip for using operating system-based file management as a means for document management. He recommends creating or saving every file in one's root storage using the following syntax, year-month-date-space-description-space-matter. This syntax takes advantage of the method which a computer uses to sort file names such that if you have a large quantity of files in a folder and use this syntax to name those files, you will be able to have all of the files line up in a chronological order as a result of the way in which they have been named. Once you've set up a document management system, the next step in using technology 
to master time is remote control, using remote access applications to control the computer or computers that you use on a regular basis to accomplish practice tasks. One of my favorite applications in this regard is LogMeIn Pro, which enables you to control computers from anywhere, at any time, at any place, so long as an internet connection is available. LogMeIn Pro provides for multi-platform support, meaning that it can be used from a Windows or Macintosh desktop, as well as on Apple iOS devices, such as the iPad or iPhone, and on Android devices, such as Samsung smartphones and LG tablets. Aside from allowing for secure, encrypted access to and remote control of the computer or computers that you use in accomplishing practice tasks, LogMeIn Pro enables you to synchronize root storage location files between host and remote locations. It also provides for remote printing of documents to a local printer without first having to separately download the file which you wish to be printed. Similarly, the application allows for the remote streaming of sound, obviating the need for you to download individual sound files from root storage for playback at a remote location. And finally, LogMeIn Pro provides for remote drive mapping that in turn enables the remote installation of programs. The time-saving and convenience potential of LogMeIn Pro and similar remote access applications is apparent in the event that one forgets an item at the office or if physical access to the office is not possible, such as in the case where one is inadvertently locked out of his or her office. One time, this actually happened to one of my former colleagues. Instead of expending time flagging down the office building's maintenance staff, I just simply accessed my colleague's computer, with his permission of course, and proceeded to email him the item that he needed. Beyond LogMeIn Pro, there are two other applications which may be of use to BlackBerry users or users who prefer an alternative platform. The first is TeamViewer, which is free, unlike LogMeIn Pro, for personal use and actually does support BlackBerry usage. There's also the application SplashTop, which is a paid application but has amazing multi-platform support insofar as it supports Amazon Kindle Fire, Chrome, Linux, and Windows Phone platforms. The fifth step in using technology to master time is to unify all communications. The key to unified communications is a tool that almost all of us have used for the past decade or more, and that is email. While we often think of email as being something which is the simple electronic equivalent of regular paper mail, the fact is that email is something much more due to its ability to include attachments as part of messages. Those attachments fall into the categories of written communication, think Microsoft Word or PDF files, verbal communication, such as MP3 sound files, or audiovisual communication, such as MP4 video files, and email can encompass all of these categories simultaneously. Think, for example, of how before email became popular, we would handle receiving from a client a fax, a voicemail message, written correspondence, and videotape footage. We would have to wait for the fax to come through and then review it in paper format. We would have to dial into the voicemail system, listen to the message left, and then either record or transcribe it for safekeeping. The written correspondence would have to be filed. Finally, the videotape footage would be filed as well, but in a different area than the written correspondence. In a single email, we can now view the facts and the correspondence as PDF documents right on our computers 
tablets or smartphones. In that same email, an audio file representing the voicemail can be saved and preserved, and the same applies in the case of a short video file. Each of these attachments can be sent immediately to a client-specific area in centralized root storage, such that the multiple filings of faxes, letters, voicemail recordings and transcriptions, and video recordings and transcriptions are bygone practices of the past. It is thus clear that email, if used properly to unify communications, has enormous time-saving potential. So how do you go about using email to unify communications? First, get rid of any physical fax machine that you might have and replace it with an online fax conversion service such as RingCentral, eFax, or MyFax. It is true that all of these conversion services require the payment of a monthly fee. However, over time, if you maintain one or more fax machines, chances are that the maintenance costs associated with these machines will usually be more than the monthly fee. Fax conversion services such as those that I mentioned automatically take incoming faxes and convert them into PDF attachments that are then emailed directly to you. Similarly, these services can also take PDF attachments and fax them to any fax number of your choosing. Once you have all faxes coming into email, the next step in using email to unify communications is to establish a centralized environment where email from all accounts can be received. Now, that is not to say that business and personal email should ever be permanently mixed together. Recent news events have certainly taught us otherwise. Fortunately, there is a way here to have the best of both worlds, namely establishment of a general sorting or clearinghouse for all email and specific separate locations for each individual message. The way to go about this is to employ a robust email client like Microsoft Outlook that permits one to establish folders for emails, both business and personal, and then to either manually sort received emails, or better, establish automatic filtering rules that carry out the sorting without human involvement. All of these folders, at least in the Microsoft Outlook universe, are contained within massive, compressed email storage files known as Personal Storage Table, or PST files. These files should be created and backed up on a regular basis. With all fax communications and written communications now being processed through email in an organized fashion, the final step in unifying practice communications through email is to arrange for voicemail messages to be converted to sound files via Google Voice, which I will discuss more in the next two slides, or a similar service such as Ring Central Office and then sent to you via email. Once you have a voicemail to email service in place, you will no longer need to take the time to call into your voicemail system to listen to messages. And perhaps more importantly, you will have the ability to file voicemail messages in the same folders as email messages. Before we turn to two screenshots from my Google Voice account that I have prepared for the next two slides, I briefly want to describe this service for those who may not be familiar with it. Google Voice, which is free for domestic calls, is essentially an advanced call forwarding service. It allows you to establish one number that, when called, will first ring one or more phones of your choosing, and if none of these phones are answered, will send the calling party to a special voicemail system. That system takes the voicemail message, converts it to an audio file, and then attaches that audio file to an email that is sent to you. One of the most noteworthy and appreciated features of Google Voice is apparent even before one reaches the main portion of the Google Voice website. That feature is two-factor authentication, otherwise abbreviated TFA, which is used not only by Google, but by banks and other corporations which require an extra level of security to be extended to their customers. As its name implies, two-factor authentication requires that two methods of verification be presented by a person requesting access to a website prior to that access being granted. 
The first method of verification is almost always a login and password. The second method of verification requires the use of a device that is personal to the person who is requesting access to Google Voice. That device, as can be seen from the screenshot here, is a smartphone. A numeric code is sent as a text message to the person requesting access who previously provided a cell phone number to Google Voice. If the code, once received, is submitted within five minutes, then access to Google Voice is granted. If, however, the code is not submitted within this time frame, then access will be denied. Beyond the advantage of protection from unauthorized access, that TFA provides to Google's customers. TFA also provides yet another advantage, and this is detection of potential unauthorized access. If, for example, a hacker tries to access a particular Google Voice customer's account, but does not have that customer's smartphone, once the first verification stage is passed, and the second stage verification code is sent to the customer, he or she will immediately become aware that unauthorized access is being sought and will take remedial measures such as changing login and password information immediately. In addition to two-factor authentication, Google Voice offers its users many different features, the most important of which pertain to how telephone calls are ultimately handled. Google Voice allows for call screening, which means that a caller is required to announce him or herself prior to proceeding to the call. It also allows for a caller's caller ID to be displayed as the caller's actual number, it allows for a time period to set the number that you have as your Google Voice number to automatically forward to voicemail in the event that you do not wish to be disturbed, such as when you're in a client meeting or recording CLE presentations like this one. Finally, and most importantly, Google Voice offers you the ability to truly unify all of your communications by sending any missed calls that you may receive to your email inbox. The emails that Google Voice will send will include a notification of the date and time of the call, and if the caller has left a message, that message will be transcribed to a sound file and sent to your email inbox as well, allowing you to listen to your voicemail immediately via email and not to have to call in to a separate voicemail number. This particular service offered by Google Voice is provided free of charge. The sixth and final step in using technology to master time is to automate accounting functions as much as possible. This is what I mean here by calling in the accounting robots. Even if you have an in-house accountant, the fact remains that we are as attorneys required to monitor the transactions that are relevant to our practices and to ensure that they are carried out within the bounds of the law and otherwise in a proper fashion. To accomplish this endeavor, and to do so efficiently and quickly, there are a variety of online or cloud-based accounting and bookkeeping applications available. Arguably, the foremost among them is QuickBooks Online, which, for a monthly fee, offers its users completely web-based access from any Windows or Mac computer. QuickBooks Online also offers the ability to export many different types of reports that accountants use in analyzing financial performance and in preparing tax filings. The greatest time-saving potential of QuickBooks Online is realized 
when you take advantage of its ability to robotically download transactions from banks, eliminating the need for manual entry of these transactions. QuickBooks Online also saves its users time by invoking a small measure of artificial intelligence in automatically categorizing downloaded transactions. Finally, the program offers special access and features to accountants employed by your firm. The ability to upload transaction information to Clio practice management software so as to create an integration between the two programs, and if your firm requires it, a full payroll service. As an alternative to QuickBooks Online, there is Zero, spelled with an X, another online accounting and bookkeeping product that has many of the features of QuickBooks Online, but for a lower monthly fee. Last but not least, there is Wave Accounting, which is free software that offers some of the functions that the paid online accounting applications provide. Wave Accounting also offers access to a network of accountants familiar with the software who can provide assistance in using it and additional accounting services. In summary, there are a total of 12 steps to transforming your practice into a telemarketing one. Six of these steps pertain to using technology to master space. First, realize that cyberspace is all space and no space simultaneously, such that it is easy to control. Second, always have two constant means of access to the internet at your disposal. Third, use scanners and the technique of scanning and saving documents to reduce paper in your practice as much as possible. Fourth, maintain physical resources such as office supplies only as absolutely needed and in small quantities. Fifth, use disk and file encryption to protect sensitive data in the digital space that you control. And finally, and most importantly, backup, backup, backup. Always backup all practice information on a regular basis in two separate geographic locations in the cloud and locally as well. Corresponding to the six steps of using technology to master space are the six steps of using technology to master time. To review, the first of these steps is to realize that documents are the least common denominator of the legal world, such that any action which facilitates their generation or editing will most likely result in time savings. In this regard, the second step of mastering time is to automate document drafting and preparation as much as possible. Third, make use of a document management system that allows you to speedily locate and retrieve documents, as well as one that provides for version control that enables you to track revisions to documents as they are created. Fourth, use remote access applications to remotely control firm computers and to access all firm practice information whenever you desire and wherever an internet connection is present. Fifth, save tons of time by unifying all communications via email. And finally, sixth, utilize modern accounting software that provides for the robotic automated downloading of bank transactions. There are many benefits 
to taking the plunge and transforming your practice into a Telemachian one. The foremost among these, in my mind, is the general ease of adopting a virtual office business model, a mode of practice where your office is anywhere on demand, such that you do not need to have a brick and mortar office in order to conduct business. There are some rewards corollary to adoption of such a business model. These include reduced overhead, resulting in cost savings, insofar as one does not need to have furniture or other fixed physical resources, and reduced general liability exposure, insofar as one does not need to worry about actually maintaining a premises such that premises liability exposure is de minimis at best. A virtual office model also empowers clients by giving them accessibility to you at their residences or their office locations on their schedule and their terms, saving them and gaining you money in the process on account of an enhanced rapport that is created between you and these clients. Last but not least, there is a psychological advantage to be gained in adopting a virtual office model of business. That is the ability to take a neutral space, such as a courtroom, or even what might be thought of as enemy territory, namely opposing counsel space, and to turn that into your space by virtue of your high FMV level and unstoppable ability to access your specific practice resources. Beyond facilitating adoption of a virtual office model of business, Telemachian Law Practice offers the following additional significant benefits. First, more quality time with family and friends. Second, protection from natural disasters terrorism, and other unforeseeable events. And finally, and most importantly, greater personal satisfaction in the practice of law as a result of increased FMV. I hope that you have enjoyed this CLE presentation and learning about Telemachian Law Practice. Should you have any questions or comments, please feel free to call or email me. I wish you the best of luck and success in your respective practices and hope to see you walking the path of the one who strikes from afar.